So I'm dreaming of this place. It's Leopold's Book Bar Cafe. It's the dreamiest bookstore, cafe, and cocktail bar combo you'll ever find. And it's right here at 1301 Regent Street. They've got the latest books from around the world, wines to sip or take home, and live jazz, plus open hours until midnight most nights of the week. You can grab a drink or dessert and just kick back at Leopold's. Today on CityCast Madison. It's Thursday, so of course, we're dishing on Madison's food scene. You might have noticed that falls at our doorstep. And for many of us, the new season's bringing in a freshly packed calendar. So how do we keep eating healthy with more hectic schedules and perhaps less energy to cook? We knew just who to ask. Food blogger Lauren Rudersdorf, who also writes for Edible Madison. Lauren's expert at fall meals and prep. It's Thursday, September 21st. I'm Bianca Martin, and here's what Madison's talking about. Lauren, hello. Hello. So you are a food writer and food blogger who highlights local ingredients. You also ran a veggie farm for years. I want to peek into your fridge. What's good this week? Well, it's very full. Uh, that's the the running joke. Anytime we have friends over, they're like, hey, can I put some beer in your fridge? And I'm like, no. Why would you think there's space in there? <laughs> there's like seven watermelons and the produce drawers are overflowing. Like, there's no room for beer. That's a different fridge altogether. Yeah, duh. <laughs> Come on. Who do you think I am? Um, the fridge is looking good. It is like the best season of the year for food, in my opinion. Where it's a little rainy today, so I know like things are they're coming to a close, but they're still we're in our garden. We've got like peak tomato, peak watermelon. We just pulled all of the winter squash out of the field. We've been preserving, you know, for weeks, if not months. And it's just a really, really tasty time. Like there's a little bit of everything available. Oh, my gosh. One of my favorite pictures is the first time I signed up for a CSA. and It was just full, like heaven bounty. And it was about this time of year. It's a beautiful thing. I've seen your Instagram. You've got Superwoman vibes. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Do you ever feel like there's just like not enough time in our in our lives today to make a good home cooked meal? You know the answer to that. Like, oh, my gosh, especially in September, because I I would say that because we were farmers, because we just we just love food. My husband and I like that's a thing we bonded over. That's like one of our passions. I know we cook more than like the average American. Um, And it's a huge priority in our life. And we still don't always feel like we have time to do it. Like to make it, we're not making a home cooked meal every night because that just like, it takes all of your time. We do a lot of like batch cooking little things on weekends or making huge pots of things when we can, because even as someone who's obsessed with food and loves food, it can feel like a grind. You pick up your kids from daycare, you get home, you make a meal, you clean it up and it's bedtime. And you're like, wait a second, what happened to like my entire night? So you have to like live that balance of like cooking really well, being okay with takeout here and there, eating less well other days, being fine with that too. It's like, for me, it's very much a balance of like enjoying a lot of good food, but still like living my life because you got to live your life too. But September is kind of another story. We're like, full on tomato preservation over here. So I don't think I have a life outside of my kitchen, really. Like I got home from vacation, harvested 80 pounds of tomatoes and was like, let's go. Let's get as much of this going as we can. What are some of your favorite like quick and easy weeknight dinners? Just getting food on the table after a busy day. Yeah, absolutely. The best thing I would say about this season is like soups. Soups are your best friend because you can throw. We aren't vegetarian, but we love to eat a lot of veggies. I'm sure that's just our CSA background. I love to eat as many vegetables as I possibly can and not have it take hours to prep. And soup is kind of the best for that. You just chop a bunch of stuff up and you throw it in a pot and you let it simmer and you can do other things and it's delicious. So 
I don't know, some of my favorite soups. I love, again, tomatoes. I can't not talk about tomatoes. Like, I love fresh tomato soups right now. They're so easy. Tomato soup is, like, extra easy because there's not that much chopping involved. You just throw a bunch of tomatoes in a pot. You just cook them down. Yeah, you just cook them down. Like, add some herbs, whatever you're feeling, oregano, basil, um, some chicken broth. Oh, my goodness. We're in cozy fall girl season. Fall person season. (laughs) Include Everyone's included. (laughs) Yes. I went on vacation for the first two weeks of September, which I never got to do when I was a farmer. It was wonderful. But I came back and the season did totally change. I feel in summer, I eat a lot of fresh salads, like a lot of like cucumber salads and roasted beet salads and tomato with burrata and gazpacho and pasta salads with tons of veggies. And I'm really feeling that. And I got home and I was like, ooh, I get to like roast everything everything soup all of a sudden like warm flavors yeah it was really like a kind of fun shift to come home to because I feel like by the end of summer you're kind of like you're ready for the fall flavors you really are ready to dive in so we're roasting a lot of stuff right now we feel like we're roasting a lot and we're making a lot of soup is kind of like the theme in our household like what kinds of soup my favorite my all-time favorite is called cabbage patch soup um that recipe is on my blog the leek and the carrot it's tomatoey, of course, because like I'm saying, everything I'm doing right now is tomatoey. But it's like a whole head of cabbage. Some peppers are sauteed with some onions. Then you throw the cabbage in, you throw the tomatoes in, and you just let it like wilt down, cook down. I usually put ground venison in it because my husband's a hunter and we always have a lot of ground venison in our freezer. And then you add a little chili powder and brown sugar at the end to just, I don't know, something about cabbage being a little sweet It is so good. It's not a pureed soup. It's just literally like wilted cabbage and like a tomato broth. It's delicious. It's really good. Really good. You got to cook up that cabbage with some brown sugar. I love it. That sounds good. That sounds really good. It's like my mom used to make it when I was growing up and I just loved it. Kind of ran with it, turned it into our own thing. And that is a winter staple in our house because all those things like preserve really well and I can't get sick of it. My husband gets a little sick of it. I cannot get sick of it. I didn't hear that. I'm sorry about that. (laughs) And you said that you're you're roasting a lot right now. Like, what's your approach to food prep? Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. I, as I've gotten older, as we have, we had a child, it's gotten simpler, which I really like. I used to be one of those people who was like, make a creative meal every night. And it was really fun but I don't really have time for that anymore. And so I definitely have fallen into this pattern of repetition of core meals that really work for me. So like every week we're usually making a soup, even in, you know, summer, maybe we're doing a gazpacho. And then, you know, we're usually doing like a pasta every week in summer. It's got a ton of sauteed or fresh vegetables in it. In winter, it's more of like a cheesy, creamy, using what's in the freezer kind of situation. But then my my one like really big staple, I would say year round is, I don't know if you call them grain bowls or grain salads or what exactly, like rice bowls, exactly what you'd call them. But something where I can have a carby base so it can be like a local grain. Like I love like rye berries or spelt berries from Meadowlark um, Organics. Like that's a really cool ingredient where you can get like a almost rice texture, like a really hearty grain, but it's also like grown locally and it's made locally, which is really sweet. So I'll cook up a grain of some kind. Sometimes it's rice, sometimes it's quinoa, like whatever you kind of have a feel for. And then again, in summer, we're doing a ton of fresh veggies, maybe just diced, maybe like a slaw with a little simple dressing. In fall or winter, we're doing more roasting for those veggies because you've got like carrots and beets, you've got all these root crops, you've got winter squash, you've got Brussels sprouts. And so for me, I love to roast because again it's that simplicity it's like yeah it takes a little while to prep it but then you just throw it in the oven and ignore it completely for an hour and it's great and it comes out and it's caramelized and it's so good and so you can pair veggies with local grains or whatever grains you can get your hands on and that makes like a really great foundation for a dish and then you can add kind of whatever you if you need protein you can add a piece of salmon you can add some steak you can add whatever some shredded chicken from a chicken you roasted earlier in the week um, you can av- add avocado, but you can kind of like riff with this. Some garbanzo beans. Yes, yes, yes. Like get some protein, get a ton of veggies, get a carb kind of base. And then I just make a sauce again with whatever. Sometimes we just do a mayo sauce because why would you not make like a spicy mayo? But other times you can 
blend a bunch of herbs up and turn that into like an oily, wonderful kind of dressing. And we do that a lot, like really a lot. It makes great lunches, makes great dinners. It's I like to do that on the weekend and I can make a bunch of kind of like batched components and then you can throw it together different ways throughout the week. If you're like, okay, actually, I'm over the garbanzo beans. Give me an avocado instead. Or, okay, actually, now I need a piece of salmon. Like, you can play with the flavors and play with the combos. Eat from it for multiple days, not get sick of it. Like, that's definitely a hack that I lean on heavily. So you keep them, like, separate in the fridge? Like, you keep them separate so you can mix and match? Exactly. And I would say that's probably my biggest food prep tip, is that I keep a lot of things separate in the fridge because I'm very... I like texture in my food. Like, I don't want it all to turn into like one mushy thing. I feel like I haven't internalized this lesson somehow. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that could keep it separate. <laughs> it's, I, it's a hard lesson to learn. I've done it over many years of eating mushy foods and being like, oh, I should have like kept the peanuts over there. Why did I put the peanuts with the kale in the fridge? That's not good. I do keep things separate. And then you add the dressing like when it's time to eat your lunch. You can like build the bowl for your lunch, it's going to keep fine for a day. But I do tend to keep the components separate so I can kind of like play with it a little bit more. That feels more fun to me. I'm really glad you brought up a green bowl because I feel like it's one of those things that are also out. If I really feel like eating healthy and I go get something out, it's probably going to be a green bowl. <laughs> so like it's just like you can make them yourself pretty easily and like get the get that bang for your buck at home. I think most people, they people love Forage Kitchen. We all love Forage Kitchen because you can go and you can customize your own grain bowl right there or your own salad bowl and not have to like work that hard. But that's why I tend to batch so many things because it's like if I'm going to go through the effort to make a grain bowl, I do. I want to eat it six times and I want there to be some pick and choose options so I don't get bored with it, but I can still eat it many days in a row because otherwise, yeah, you're not going to want to make like six components and eat it once. That sounds horrible. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> you know, you mentioned kale and kale is one of these guys that I absolutely love. Um, and like, it feels like it might take a lot of work. Like, I don't even know where to begin with kale except for that I don't I'm not very successful with including it, but I want to be because I like it. So my question for you is, do you have to massage it for hours? Like, what? how do you make kale good? Like, what's what's happening with kale? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Good question. Good question. I love kale. Again, I'm sure that is like my veggie farmer roots showing because every farmer loves kale because it's insanely abundant. Like, you never you never don't have enough kale ever. <laughs> There's always so much of it. And so I think... For me, I started cooking with it a lot when it was just like, oh my gosh, we need something for dinner. I want some greens. Okay, there's plenty in the field. I'll just go harvest them and bring it home and I have to figure out what to do with it. So it's kind of fun learning to cook as a veggie farmer because you have a ridiculous amount of abundance. But sometimes we were CSA farmers. We would have an abundance of, I don't want to say the bad stuff, but like the stuff we've already given to the CSA members six times that's still in our field that someone's got to eat. So like I kind of had to learn to use things that maybe other people didn't love. And I now get like teased at Edible Madison because I think I have developed three kale salad recipes since I've been like recipe developing there. And they're like, OK, Lauren, like, cool it. Like, give us a salad with another green. But I really <laughs> not a chance. Not a chance. <laughs> kale for life. Not for me. <laughs> um, so there are three really good kale salad recipes on the Edible Madison website. But I so I don't massage kale. I have. It's fine. I know a lot of people who swear by that. I know a lot of farmers who swear by it. I want to say I'm a lazy cook. People would probably laugh if they heard that because they know how I cook. But like I, I do try to be pretty efficient. My favorite way to eat kale is in raw form. But what I've seen to work really, really well is you do a pretty heavy dressing. Like it's a heavy green. It's not lettuce. If you put more dressing on it, it can stand up to that. You can put a, a rich, heavy, creamy dressing on it that's really good. And you let it sit for a few hours. And it absorbs it? Yeah. Like I put kale in the category of like, almost cabbage. It's not quite as hearty, but it's similar. So, you know, like when you make a coleslaw, you dress it and like, ideally you eat it like a few hours later, like you can eat it right then. But if you let it sit in the fridge, like it starts wilting down. And like, especially if that dressing has a good amount of salt and pepper in there, like it's and sh maybe some sh something a little sweet, it's going to like be breaking down those fibers. So this is another one of those like kind of component hacks where I will like make my dressing, cut up my kale, 
cut it up really small. That's another tip. I'll like cut it very, very finely. I actually like chiffonade it ish. Um, and so by that, I mean, I'll rip the stem out, stack it up, and then I'll try to like just stack it as much as I can and like really finely slice it with my knife so that I'm getting like pretty fine pieces. I'll make my dressing. I'll toss the two together with my hands, but I won't really massage. I'll just toss it really, really well. And I might let it sit for half an hour while I prepare the next part of my meal. Or maybe if I'm making it for lunch the next day, I'll just dress it, throw it in a Pyrex, throw it in the fridge, and then like top it with whatever other things the next day. Lauren, this is a game changer. I am so (laughs) glad I, I am literally like, oh my God, this is why I like try to eat it immediately. And it's like, this is hard to eat. It is. It totally is. You're like, I'm chewing a lot. I don't get it. <laughs> am I a brontosaurus yet? I'm, you know, I'm like trying to get through and I'm like, why am I doing something wrong? And it's like, because you're just eating it so fast. But I, you know, I end up getting attracted to dino kale. And I feel like exactly what you're saying, where I could stack it well, so I could cut the stem. But then I'm learned there's like so many different varieties of kale. Yes, yes. I am also a fan of dino kale. Like that is our, our, our garden only has that. The curly, I find it ages a little worse. Like curly kale in the spring is really, really good. But as you go through the season, is that kind of what the standard one, if you get like, uh, you know, a bag at the grocery store, that's what the curly kale is? Yeah, yeah. And they're starting to have, I feel like more and more, they're starting to be both varieties available at stores. But yeah, I would say I definitely see the curly kale more frequently. And that's fine if you're like cooking it down. You can't totally tell a difference, but I don't think it breaks down as well in a salad. Like if you're, if you're, Trying to do kale salads a lot more with curly kale, then massaging might be a better option. And that just means essentially like putting some salt and some oil on it and literally like massaging it with your fingers, breaking down the fibers as much as you can. Then I really like to top it with, again, like pretty hearty stuff. So dressings I do, like I have a peanut dressing that is my favorite kale dressing ever. I think it was originally a Martha Stewart recipe maybe, but it's peanuts and maple syrup and apple cider vinegar and oil. But you just like puree it in your food processor till it's like this creamy peanut amazingness. And the the peanuts are so hearty that it really like it's enough to break down the kale and like balance the kale. And then you can throw just a ton of other veggies in there. You could do carrots, you could do peppers, you could do radishes, kind of whatever you're feeling, whatever you have. All those things can be raw because again, you're going for this like very crunchy salad. Um, That's probably my favorite kale salad ever, but like roasted squash and apple, those are like hearty things you can throw on a kale salad and they can like stand up to it. Where like if you were to put a bunch of cups of roasted squash on a lettuce salad. It's just going to wilt the salad and like kind of it's going to fall apart so fast. That's why I like kale is I can like add a ton to it and turn it into a meal pretty easily. It's a strong it's a strong character. We love strong characters. OK, love strong characters. Speaking of strong characters, winter squash. What are what are your favorite tips for cooking that? Roasted always, just like absolutely always roasted for me. Um, I did have grilled squash this last weekend at a friend had a fire, like a bonfire, and they roasted it over in like a cast iron skillet over the fire and it got super charry, really smoky. And that was very tasty. But I love to roast it. And then I usually, you know, I'll, you know, put it with olive oil, salt, and pepper, roast it. And then when there's like maybe five minutes left in the roasting, I'll put some maple syrup on there. Occasionally you can do like some chili powder or some red pepper flakes or some like cinnamon or allspice. Like you can play with those like warming flavors and it'll add this extra caramelization factor because you're adding the sweetener and keeping it roasting a little bit and it'll bring out the sweetness in the squash. That is my absolute go-to. I'm getting so excited for fall. It's fall. It's fall. (laughs) I'm like, yes. Yes. We're ready. We made it. I also love like a squash soup, though, too. That is one of my standby soups in the fall and winter is that like you can roast it. You don't have to. Um, I usually roast again because I'm lazy. Then I don't have to peel it. I can just like roast the halves, get it really, really soft, scoop out the inside, throw it in a pot and like make a soup out of it. Usually with like coconut milk and curry kind of flavors. I really, really love that kind of squash soup. It's so tasty. I love uh, spaghetti squash too. I feel like that's a good easy one. You can scoop out some of the that love. Yeah. Where do you find inspiration for developing your, your recipes? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the reason I'm so into eating local and eating seasonally is because I, I find so much inspiration just in like that alone. 
the second we decided to end our CSA farm, I like subscribed to a CSA immediately. I get a CSA share from my friend at Winterfall Acres. The things that the farmer sends you together become the inspiration for me in a certain sense. In winter, I get really uninspired. And I think a huge part of that is because like you're eating the same things day after day, but I don't have a CSA share every week. Like I don't have items coming directly to me because they're in season at the same time. And then I have to like figure it out. So I get a ton of inspiration just from like, okay, I've got like, I can't even think of an example, but I've got like fennel and cilantro and onions. And like, what am I going to do with those things? Oh, they came together. So they're probably going to taste good together. That's kind of a fun trick with local seasonal eating is that most things that are like ready at the same time taste pretty good together. And then you can start to just riff and experiment with them you kind of get to know these staples too, where like, okay, there's these categories of food. There's slaws, there's salads, there's soups, there's grain bowls, there's casseroles. They're like, you learn like these big categories and then you get these ingredients each week and you start to like riff on them and play with them. And I get a ton of inspiration just from that. Lauren, thank you so much for giving us some of your tips about how to cook efficiently, be creative and eat healthy. So happy to. So happy to. Thanks so much for having me. That's Lauren Ruderstorf, local food writer with Edible Madison. She also blogs at Locally Grown with Lauren Ruderstorf and The Leek and the Carrot. Check out our show notes for links to her writing and a host of the recipes she mentioned. And here's what else Madison's talking about. This year's Big Ten Conference men's basketball schedule is out. Big picture, Wisconsin's regular season will have 17 home games, including 10 Big Ten Conference matchups. The season officially begins November 6th. Meanwhile, the women's basketball team has seven home games planned this season and begins November 7th. Whose favorite season is it? It's my November. And there's even more evidence that childcare in our state is more expensive than college tuition. A new report from Ford Analytics shows that childcare costs run anywhere between nearly a fifth and more than a third of a family's income. There are proposals at the state capitol right now to address steep childcare costs. Last week, the Assembly passed six bills aimed at loosening regulation on child care providers. These bills come after the legislature rejected Governor Evers' proposal last month, and the governor is expected to veto the latest bills. So the tango continues. That's all for today here on CityCast Madison. I'm Bianca Martin. If you enjoyed the show, why not share this episode with someone you know who goes hard for soup season? We'll be back tomorrow morning with more stories from around the city. Until then, do you remember? 21st night, September. We were dancing the night away. Have a good day.